Today's lecture is on the Yiktol conjugation, the Vayiktol conjugation, infinitives and imperatives. I know this sounds like a lot, but I promise this won't be bad. Let's begin by looking at the uses of the Yiktol. Now, for every verb that you have memorized, you have on the flashcard the katal form and a yiktol form. Specifically, it's the third person masculine singular katal and yiktol forms. I've told you that you can think of the top flashcard form, the he did it form, and the bottom form, the he will do it form. That's a bit of a simplistic view. Here's going to be the bigger picture which is that katal and yiktol form this dichotomy in the language. They form this fault line across tense, aspect, and mood, these three ways of describing a verbal action. Remember, tense describes when an action occurred, aspect describes how the action is being viewed, and mood says whether the action happened or describes something in the realm of possibility. Now, there are hardly two Hebrew professors that would describe this tense aspect mood and how the Hebrew verbal system fits within it in the same way. Um, some professors will say that um, katal and yiktol, they only encode aspect. That's the only thing that they're encoding. Tense and mood just come from other factors. My view is that it encodes all of these three things, but one of these three can come to the forefront given a certain context. Let's look at four uses of the yiktol, four different uses of the yiktol, each one that occurs in the story that you have learned this week. First is the yiktol can describe just a simple future action, and this happens quite a lot. This is Yahweh speaking, Va'ani eshkon betoch b'nei Yisrael. Translate, and I will dwell in the midst of the sons of Israel. Let's look at another example here where you actually have the yiktol describing a past time action that's in progress. I'll read. Az tavona shtaim nashim el hamelech. Where here, you know, we know that this is past time just based on context because this is a narrative story describing things that happened in a certain sequence and this line in the story is carrying along the narrative. Then here is around that time where Solomon asked for wisdom, this thing happened. But it doesn't use a katal verb, ba'u, it uses the yiktol form tavona. So it's not two women came, but two women, I believe, were coming. And the effect is, if you think of it like a movie, the camera now is kind of parallel to the women, and it's following them as they're coming towards the king. So it slows down the narrative, and it makes us ask, wait, what's so significant about these two women coming around the same time that Solomon asked for wisdom? turns out that here is object lesson that God gave Solomon wisdom. All right, and in other contexts, mood can become prominent. Here is God um, telling Solomon, She'al ma eten lecha, where this is an imperative. You, Solomon, ask what I should give to you. This is a yiktol, but it's not just a future time, ask what I will give you, but it's more modal, what should I give you? And the modal sense comes about in context because of this question, ma, what, what I should give you. All right, you can also use the yiktol to make a command, to give a request. 
So here, Solomon responds to God saying, Titen le'avdecha lev shomea, where he doesn't respond with an imperative ten, but he uses the yiktol form titen. And what it, you can think of it as like um, a more polite way of making a request. Um, it's not so sharp and abrupt as giving an imperative, and it's especially fitting here where Solomon is making a request of the king of the universe. And so it's a way of, um, of acknowledging that he's far superior. And you can also see that by Solomon calling himself your servant. So he refers to himself in the third person, uh, making himself low. I'm just your servant. And so he doesn't here use the imperative. He uses the yiktol for making a request. Next, let's talk about this vayiktol conjugation. Here's this tense aspect mood chart that we saw before with just the katal and the yiktol. Turns out there's actually two more conjugations, but uh, they each correspond Vayiktol corresponds exactly to katal, and vekatal corresponds exactly to yiktol. Um, we won't talk about vekatal until next semester, so here just looking at this side of the chart, vayiktol has the same kind of meaning as katal, but where they differ is in their distribution. So usually when you have a story, a katal verb will start the story, and then the main line of the story is carried along by vayiktol forms, where you have like, he got up, and he got dressed, and he got in the car, and he drove to work, and he drank coffee, right? Where got up is a katal form, and then everything else would just be a chain of vayiktol verbs. Now, this way of describing how a Hebrew narrative is put together is actually different than what you've experienced so far by learning your first four stories, which consist solely of katal verbs. Now, I would go to the bank that every line of those stories is good biblical Hebrew, but to construct a whole story using only katal, I admit, is very contrived. Um, you will, you'll never find a narrative comprised only of katal verbs. Um, actually, you'll see a narrative mainly comprised of vayiktol verbs. I just didn't want to wait to start using stories until we had learned all of the conjugations, nor did I want to overwhelm you with forms in order to get you into a story early. So that's how I've kind, that's how I made it. Um, as a graded reader. It's all good biblical Hebrew, but slowly it's becoming more and more complex so that I can drop you in the middle of Jonah and take you through quite quickly at the end of the year without um, too much struggle. Now, with the names of these conjugations, remember the names are actually mnemonic devices. So that katal forms usually sound like katal, yiktol forms usually sound like yiktol, vayiktol forms usually sound like vayiktol, and same with vekatol. Also remember what I just said, that vayiktol corresponds in meaning and use with katal, and vekatol corresponds in meaning and use with yiktol. Having said both those things, it looks like the adding a vav to the beginning of katal and yiktol has this magical converting power. So you have a yiktol, and then all you do is add a vav at the beginning, and it makes the yiktol start acting like a katal verb. Similarly with katal, you have katal, you add a vav at the beginning, and it makes the katal start acting like a yiktol verb. This is not actually a description of historically how these conjugations arose. The story is more complex. At the end of the year, if you want to know, I can give you all of the details that I know of. Um, but seeing, seeing um, the, how similar the forms are makes recognizing vayiktol verbs and vekatol verbs really easy if you have memorized a katal form and yiktol form. This is one of the many reasons why we have you memorize a yiktol form in addition to katal, whereas most professors usually just have their students memorize katal forms for each verb. Um, because memorizing the yiktol makes recognizing vayiktol super easy, 
And my bet is that actually you can even produce many Vayikdol forms. So I've taken all the Vayikdol forms from the story, and here you have an exercise to help you produce it. Right? The first one occurs in line two. Visit. The flashcard forms are Pakad Yif Code. Remember, it's the Vayikdol. You just add a Va at the beginning. So Vayif Code. And that's indeed what our Vayikdol form is. Now, specifically, Vayikdol verbs are formed by having a Vav, a Patach, and a dagesh chazak in the first letter of what looks to be the yiktol form. All right, in line two, another one, stand. The flashcard forms amad ya'amod. Add a va at the beginning. Yep, va ya'amod. In 13, send. The flashcard forms shalach yishlach. Add a va at the beginning. Va yishlach. And 14, gather, asaf, yeesof, yep, va yeesof. And there are many vayiktol forms for to say. Flashcard forms are amar, yomar, which would lead you to guess the form vayomar, but the vayiktol form is actually vayomer, where you not only get a vowel change from patach to segol, but also an accent shift from yomar here to vayomer here. So all this is to say that a lot of times the vayiktol verb looks identical to yiktol with just an added va at the beginning, but there are several words actually where you'll get accent shift or vowel shift, um, and whereas um, they're a little harder to produce that way. They're still pretty easy to recognize, right? If you have memorized Yomar, you should be able to recognize Vayomer. These last two sections will actually go quite quickly. Here is how to form an infinitive. This is another reason why we have you memorize a Yiktol form for each verb. Uh, an infinitive occurs in line six, and it's from the verb to judge. You have memorized the yiktol form yishpot. All you have to do to form the infinitive is take your yiktol and remove the yi prefix, and you are left with shifot. And I said last week that a majority of infinitive forms are prefixed with a la preposition. In this case, all you do is you substitute lamed in for a yod, and you have lishpot. We can do the same thing here in line 11. There's an infinitive of to inquire. Darash yidrosh. You take yidrosh, take off the yi. Darosh, an infinitive plus a lamed, and that is lidrosh. And that's how you form an infinitive from your yiktol flashcard form. Just remove the yi prefix. And finally, how to form an imperative. Imperatives you can derive from the yiktol in a similar fashion to an infinitive. But the difference is there's one infinitive form, and there are four imperative forms that are actually derived by removing the prefix from the second person yiktol forms, which makes sense because imperatives are direct commands speaking to somebody, and second person is when you speak to somebody. So you remove the prefix from tish'al, and you're left with she'al. And it works down the line. She'ali... Atem, she'alu, and aten, she'alna, where these imperatives will have the same endings as the yiktol, but there won't be that prefix, and the initial vowel will be a shva. There's another imperative form that occurs in the story here from the verb to slay. Same thing, you take the yiktol chart, and all you have to do is get rid of the top, prefix, and so you have harog. Here, now what you may expect is haragi, where you have two reduced vowels in a row, two light syllables, but that's impossible in Hebrew. And so instead of two reduced vowels in a row, two light syllables, 
the first vowel lengthens so that you get one heavy syllable. So, in, so instead of haragi, you get hirgi. So here's the longer story. Uh, the imperative will actually begin with a schwa or a chata vowel, or it will begin with a chirik schwa. So same thing here, hirgu and harogna. One other thing to mention is that the ata imperative form is actually usually identical to the infinitive form. Um, and so harog here actually could be the infinitive form to slay or the imperative, hey you, slay somebody. And context is the only thing that could help you differentiate between the two.